What's up guys, I'm James O'Neill and you're here with the O'Neill Ops YouTube channel. This is the place where we break it down. We go into detail with the equipment that we use and how we use that equipment application specific. Today we're going to be taking a look at the process, the meticulous concoction that we use reloading. Reloading for what I personally feel is one of the best if not the best cartridge selections for killing coyotes. The Remington 22250. Let's do this. All right, guys, a little disclaimer here. I want to go into detail real quick before we get into the, the reloading video. I want to go over my mindset on reloading. And this mindset correlates with a lot of the stuff that we do, whether it's building rifles, working with different manufacturers, the kind of equipment that we use to get our job done, etc. I want to explain to you guys so that you understand where we're coming from. So why do we reload? Example, we build $3,500 to $7,000 plus rifles without glass. I look at those rifles as a tool for my job. That's exactly what they are. I look at those rifles just as I look at the auto track in my John Deere tractor. Sure, in the beginning, it's expensive, but it makes my job quicker, easier, and a lot more efficient. And in the end, it literally pays me back because of the time that it saves me. What we do, the way that we look at it is almost in terms of a math equation, we're canceling variables. That's what we're trying to do. We're, we're, we're canceling variables that we can control so that when the variables that we're exposed to that are out of our control, we can offset, if you kind of understand what I'm saying. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, uh, give you a couple brief explanations. Like I said, I wanna try to do this in about five minutes here. Uh, when you're building the rifles on the, on, the, on the value, on the dollar level, on the amount that we're investing, it doesn't make any sense not to reload for them. Absolutely no, it does not make sense not to reload because what we're doing is we're optimizing that tool. We're giving that tool the ability to perform on an exponential level. And I'll give you a couple examples here. You, right, you have Hunter A, you have Hunter B. Hunter A uh, might be the weekender. He might be the guy that just likes to go have fun. He goes to Cabela's. Bass Pro, Shields, Sportsman's Warehouse, buys a factory over-the-counter rig, Remington 700, Winchester Model 70, Ruger American Savage, whatever. Whatever his choice is, he goes and buys it. He goes now down the aisle, grabs some ammo off the shelf. In theory, that rifle, I think most manufacturers' rifles guarantee like one MOA. One MOA at 100 yards is 1.047 inches. Uh, for the purpose of this video, one MOA at 100 yards is one inch. Now let's extend that range exponentially. Let's go to 400 yards. He walks into a field. He's got a coyote lane out there at 400 yards. He feels comfortable. He thinks he can make that shot. He knows what his hold is. Start factoring in the variables. You have the variables that are not within your control and you have the variables that are within your control. The variables that are within his control may be shooting position. Maybe they're his ability, his physical ability, his physical condition. Um, the variables that are not within his control uh, might be atmospherics, humidity, temperature, wind, 
the animal be an erratic movement up, down, walking further away, maybe possibly walking closer. Uh, a, 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 you, you can essentially take those variables and I would say at least double his MOA at 400 yards. So instead of one MOA at 400 yards, which is four inches, that's what he should print on paper if everything, if he holds his own. One MOA at 400 yards is four inches. Everybody thinks that's, that's pretty good. That's not bad. But like I said, factor in those variables and that MOA group has essentially doubled, if not more, depending on, on how terrible the conditions are. So you take that four inch group and you can easily take it to eight. That's the difference between a killing shot, a wounding shot, a wounding shot and a complete air ball. Now let's take Hunter B. Maybe this guy is a little more disciplined. Maybe it's, it's his job. Maybe he's willing to invest a little bit more money in a little higher end equipment, take the necessary steps to make that equipment perform on another level. Like I said, nothing against uh, the guy that doesn't, but maybe this guy does it for his livelihood. Now he's got a custom built rifle. He reloads for it. Let's use a quarter inch, a quarter MOA for this example. A, a quarter MOA at 100 yards, that's a quarter inch. You, you increase that range exponentially to 400 yards, the same kind of scenario as Hunter, a, as Hunter A. That group, a quarter MOA group, goes to one inch. That's one inch versus four inches because he invested the money and he invested the time reloading. Now let's factor all of the variables in this factor in the variables you can't control, atmospherics, the coyote moving around, um, but more importantly, let's focus on the variables that he can control. Maybe he is in shape. Maybe he is, uh, you know, cardiovascularly inclined. He could shoot between heart rates. Maybe he can cover a wide distance, a long distance, get into a solid shooting position and be able to control his breathing a lot more than somebody can't. That's a variable that you can control. Each one of you out there have that ability to control that. That's, that's factor in the, the variables that he's already canceled. The custom rifle, the reloading side of things, he's done an, uh, an enormous amount of work by just canceling out uh, errors by reloading and taking his group size down to such uh, a precise measurement. Let's give Hunter A the benefit of the doubt. You know, say, say Hunter B, he's, he, uh, his group size say it, his, his quarter MOA group size opens up four, five times. That's still inches, guys. That's the difference between an eyeball shot and a forehead shot. You know, that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's how we perceive it, and that's how we look at it. It's not us bragging and telling guys, hey, dude, this is how we do it. A lot of guys uh, it, think it's easy. You know, if it was easy, everybody would do it. That's the saying. We learned that a long time ago. If it's easy, Everybody can do it. A lot of people watch videos and like, oh, dude, that's easy. I do it. I watch uh, Major League Baseball players throw 95 miles an hour. They're so fluent. They have such fundamentally sound skills when they throw it. It looks easy. You're like, dude, give me the ball. I can do that. No, you can't. No, you'll never be able to do that. This is different. We're teaching you guys that you can. You know, some guys are, are gifted, you know, beyond belief. They can uh, perform on a level that most guys can't physically, but you can learn this stuff. You've got to take the time, you've got to do your part, but you absolutely can learn it, and that's what we're here to kind of show you guys. So with that said, guys, um, uh, I hope that you guys enjoy it. I hope that I can make this entertaining for you. We're gonna go through all the, all the steps. I'm going to be telling you all of the hardware that you're gonna need, all of the components that you're gonna need, and some of the stuff that I have is going to be a little bit more elaborate. You're not going to necessarily have to have the detailed equipment that I have. Like I said, it goes back to everything, canceling variables. Some of the stuff that I have is expensive, but it cuts my workload in half. It cuts my time reloading in half. And in the end, that pays me. I can get in, I can reload, I can get out, and I can do what needs to be done. That's the way that we look at it. So let's start reloading, guys. I hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. What I'm going to go over is all of the reloading hardware that you're gonna need, as well as all of the components that you're gonna to need to reload. Uh, another thing that I really wanna do is, because a lot of you guys are gonna be new reloaders, 
and you're going to have all new components, I'm going to basically be doing two initial steps in the very beginning. And what I mean by that is I'm going to be reloading some new brass where really you don't have to do anything other than inspect it. And then I'm going to be reloading a few times fired brass where you have to do a few more additional steps such as uh, um, resizing, depriming, triming, etc. Annealing again and we'll get into that. But first I'm going to uh, go over all of the components and all of the hardware that you're going to need. First and foremost I would say a handbook, some kind of a guideline, some kind of a manual so you can get an idea on uh, the, the grain of powder, the grains of powder that you're going to use, the, the grain of bullet that you're going to use, the um, overall length, all of the measurements that you're going to need. It's, it's just basically it's a necessity. You're going to want to have an uh, up-to-date reloading manual. And there's a lot of stuff nowadays, guys. I've actually got the Hornady app on my phone. I've got the Hodgkin app on my phone, and you can get all of that data digitally, if you will, instead of paperback. But I've got numerous hard copies, and it's it's just a good thing to have, and it's something that you're going to need. For a good steady workflow, uh, a hard bench, a good reloading bench helps. We just built this. You guys can see we've got all of our presses lined up. We get a, a kind of a an assembly line, if you will, lined out here where one guy might be doing one step, another guy will be doing another step, and another guy will be doing another step, and it just increases our workflow. It's a lot easier for us. A lot of guys aren't gonna have a setup like this, but a good, solid work bench is, is a really nice option to have. Presses. There's a lot of good presses out there. This is what I started with. I started with a Rock Chucker Supreme. And then I kind of, I would say, graduated to uh, or moved to the Forster Coax Press. You'll hear me say this a lot of times in this video, but uh, a lot of things that we gravitate towards are time sensitive. They're, they're time saving, I should say. And that press saves a lot of time. It's, it's easier. You don't have to mess around. Uh, putting uh, shell holders in it. it. It's just basically a one setup type of deal and I'll kind of show you guys how we do it. I really like that Forrester Coax press. Then we, of course we're not going to get into it but we've got a Dillon press for all of our handguns where we want to do mass reloading a couple thousand rounds a day maybe you can get into that. But for the purpose of this pick out a press. There's a lot of options out there. Like I said I really like the Forrester Coax press and they actually reached out to us, Forrester did, and we've been working with them a little bit on, on certain things here and there, components, dies, and, and I'll also make note of that once we get to it. With the presses, you're gonna need to pick out some dies. And as I said before, we're gonna go into detail. On the die that Forrester sent us, the sizing die, there's, there's a, a lot of different dies, like I said, that I've used. Small base sizer dies, full length sizer dies. Uh, neck sizers, uh, full length bushing dies, which is what a lot of guys are recommending now. Um, you know, the, I could go into detail on all of them. The small base sizer dies, we were using a lot of those with AR platforms to squeeze the webbing down so that we had less issues with feeding and chambering in, in colder conditions. You're, you're really, really working your brass hard on that, but in order to make them run, there's certain things that you have to do. What I'm setting myself up with right now is a full length, it's a custom die from, from Forrester, and, and I'll, I'll touch base on it, we'll get in detailed, but it's a custom reamed die where I measured a seated bullet, the, the bullet that I was using in the brass that I'm using, which is Lapua brass, and they custom reamed the sizer so that I would get the exact neck tension that I want, which is right around that 2,000th neck tension. There's, there's uh, competition dies where, you, where they have micrometers on them and you can adjust the, the dial or the, the, the measurement lines per thousandths. And there's a, a, a dial on this from Forrester that we also got and I'll kind of show you guys that, that you can do a similar type of feature as well. Cedar dies, same thing. 
You can get yourself into to competition cedar dyes. For the purpose of this, we're just going to use a, a regular cedar dye, cedar bullet. We'll, we'll go through the measurement process and get it all lined up so you guys get a basic understanding. You're going to need some kind of a dispenser, a powder dispenser. I started off with a manual scale. I just trickled it by hand and I'm not going to lie, I was, I mean, it was kind of skittish. You're using Varget in a 223 and the, one of the first loads that I, I remember gassing up was actually a compressed load. And, you know, it's, it's not abnormal, but it's, it's one of those things where a beginner, you're just like, is this right? Is it supposed to be like this? Pay attention to your powder. Obviously there's different burn rates. There's different burn charts. We've talked with, with Chad at LRI where guys were using, guys have dicked up and they were using a 338 Norma and the guy messed up and put like a pistol powder in it and it, it split his action in two. So just, you want to pay attention on stuff like that because you don't, you don't get a second chance when you mess shit up. Um, we've upgraded our scales. I've went from, which it gives us more appreciation for the whole process, the whole concept. We went from the handheld scale, the tip scale, the manual scale to digital scales behind us. We're running a few different RCBS uh, charge masters and then we've just recently upgraded to the new match masters they're real nice uh, they work real well and we can run multiple multiple units at the same time with the same powder and once again increase our workflow just hammer them out something you don't need to have but it's a luxury that we do have um, you, so some tools that you're going to need like uh, comparators like here's a Hornady bullet comparator. This allows you to measure a datum line somewhere on your ogive to your case head. And it gives you a reference point, how far your bullet is seated off the lands. It's, it's, a, it's a good tool to have. It's a simple concept. We'll show you how to use that. And then we also have, this is a Forster comparator as well, but it, it's used to measure a similar concept, a datum line, where this I have set up, it measures a, a point on a case shoulder back to the case head so you can measure your shoulder bump off your head space in your chamber. It's tools like that, once you get into it, are real nice. Uh, caliper, this is a huge, you know, you don't have to have a digital one, but this is a huge tool. You're going to want it. You're going to have to have a caliper. I, I have a dial caliper and I've got a digital one. There's some real expensive, good ones out there. This is, you know, a $50 ultra tech, nothing crazy, but it, it, it does what we do. Uh, shell holders, all of this stuff is pretty nice. You know, you've got shell holders like this. It just, it, it's nice. You, it's something that comes along with reloading. You can prime your rounds. You can set them in there. You can turn them upside down if they're loaded, if they're not loaded, if they're primed, if they're not primed. It's Extra shell holders are always nice. We've got stuff laying all over like that. Case lube, you're going to want to have that. We have dry lube here that a lot of guys use. I, I really... Uh, wax is good. I, I've used it. Same thing as this, that's what this is, RCBS case resizing lube. And I'll show you guys how to do that. It's, it's a pretty simple concept, but when you're full length sizing, you're gonna wanna have lube because it's just something that you, you, get, you get a case stuck up in, a, in the die, which everybody I'm assuming probably has. It's kind of a pain in the ass. It's kind of a pain in the butt to get that out. We've got a tool to do that, but lube them up. We'll show you how to do it and you won't have any issues. Another, you know, real quick, we'll go into the, the reloading components. You have brass, you have bullets, you have primers, and you have powder. You're gonna need all of those. Brass, bullets, powder, primer. I'm gonna show you how to do all of that, starting points. Um, and go from there. A, 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 a kind of a disclaimer, there's always going to be guys out there that are butt hurt and stuff at what we're doing because it's not their way. Now there are definitely wrong ways to reload, but there are also a few different right ways to do it. We're not F-class shooters. We're not bench rest shooters. I'm not a PRS guy. The reason that I do this is for precision hunting. 
It's exactly what it is, precision hunting. I want to, to build custom rifles that we can tailor a load to shoot as well as we possibly can. And that's our goal with reloading. The, the whole idea of reloading to me is uniformity. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's being 100% redundant. It's doing the same thing over and over and over. If you can do every single step the same to every single cartridge that you load, in theory on paper, that bullet should basically do the same thing every time you shoot it. So just think about that. You know, a bench rest shooter, he's gonna pull the trigger the same way. He's gonna wait for no wind so that that bullet flies the exact same path as the previous one. Our goal here for reloading is to do a similar type of thing. Make each cartridge that we develop and reload for the exact same. And that's what we're gonna show you how to do here. So with that, all of that, we're gonna get started with the first step. We're gonna go through all of the, the, the whole process. All right, guys, now, the, am I wearing a medium shirt? No, it's extra large. I'm just fing big. <laughs> all right, uh, you don't have to do this step. You don't have to anneal. We actually resize some brass. Annealing is, is something that I would almost say we just more, more so than not, we recently got into it. Annealing, it changes the metallurgy of the, of the brass. It changes it. It changes the, 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 the structure of it. And the more you work brass, the more rigid, the harder, the more brittle it gets. So by annealing it, it takes the, the alloy, the brass, and makes it soft again. So you're getting better resilience. You're getting more uniform neck tension. And with more uniform neck tension, you're getting more uniform velocity. And that goes back to what I was saying. The more uniform everything, the better results you're gonna get. So by annealing, you're gonna get more uniform results. You don't have to do it. We've been working with these guys, annealing made, annealing made perfect amp. This is the Mark II annealer. This is crazy, man. This, the, the, this stuff that this, that this thing does, I may do a separate video on it, but it, it's got like a, a magnetic coil inside that actually heats the brass. There's not a heating element itself. But what you basically do is, long story short, you take one piece of brass that's, that's a sacrificial piece, you put it in here, and it will melt the brass, but it evaluates it and tells you what setting it automatically needs to be at to perfectly heat this brass piece up to give you the best, the, the best possible option. We've got a bunch of, of brass here that we've already done. I mean, look at that. It's just every single one of them is perfect. This is actually 260 brass. I'm gonna show you guys real quick here. So what we've got guys here is the setup. I kind of told you guys what you did at the initial. I'm not gonna get into a lot of elaborate detail on this. What you do is once it analyzes the brass that you're running in it, you write down your run code. So for my Lapua brass, my run code is this, and it also keeps memory so that it, it, it records what you previously put in it. I was using it to, to do Lapua 250 brass this week, so it's already stored in here. All I have to do is hit run, and it'll, it, it automatically hits my, uh, Last code, my last code. So you got to call it here, put your piece of brass in, use last, zero means we haven't done any yet. Hit start, light turns red, done. We'll do five real quick and they're hot. Two. Like I said, you don't have to do this. I could run you guys through the setup, but long story short, what we're doing here is extending the life of our brass. We're making it more resilient so that we get more firings 
out of brass that's very expensive. And those are done. That's annealing. Now we'll go over to sizing. So what we're gonna do guys, after I said we, this is fire form to our chamber, we're gonna measure and bump this shoulder. That's what we're gonna do. This is just so that when we bump it, it chambers easy, like I said. It's, uh, it's something that you wanna do when you're, especially if you're hunting, because it, you, know, you, you chamber around hard, you wanna bump that shoulder so your bolt closes easy, you got a little bit of room there but you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to, you don't want to have too much of a gap in your headspace there and cause any kind of a freaking case separation. So what we're going to do is we've got the Forrester comparator and that's going to measure our datum line on our shoulder here. I put it in, I mount it to my jaw of my caliper and we, we just zeroed it out. This is a case that's just been fired. This is zeroed out. So we're going to size one, put it in its place and it'll give us the difference. One of the tools that Forrester came out with that's really nice for, for precise measurements, and I've got a couple of these. These are the new AccuRings from Forrester. It's, if, you, if you can zoom in and look at this, in between the long hash and the short hash, it measures one thousandth of an inch. So if you, if you look at this, for all, all you really need is a reference point, and this so lines up that there's a vent hole in this die, in this resizer die, and you can sight down close enough to reference what hash it's on. And by doing that, it's, it's self-explanatory. Like I said, if you're concerned with seating depth and you want to work away from the lands a thousandth at a time, which is generally what we do, there you go. You dial it away and you can seat it uh, further, you can seat it closer, however you wanna do it. And the same concept uh, relates to shoulder bump. When we bump the shoulder, how I showed you the process on that, you can also create a reference point here and and bump the shoulder accordingly in increments of a thousandth due to the the AccuRing that that Forrester makes. It's it's an awesome uh, an awesome concept, no brainer. And if you want to, if you don't have a vent hole like that, it's easy enough. You can just take a permanent marker, make a little reference point, and it's the same deal. It's the same exact thing. So for lubing it up, we have, I've already applied a little bit of this case lube. Just a nice easy roll here. And then we also have the brush. You just, it's already pre-lubed. That's all you need. You don't need a lot, you just need a little bit. I can barely feel it. We've got this piece lubed up. It's got a little bit of a cam over, nice and smooth. We'll set it in here and see what our difference is. About, right about two thousandths. So that's really, really close to what we wanna be. And if I really wanna pay attention or if I really wanna double check, I'll get my rifle, I'll chamber this and make sure the bolt closes freely and easy, which it does. I've already done this before, so it's not like it's, it's, it's new to this particular rifle. It's actually bumped a little bit more than, a little bit more than two thousandths a little bit closer to three, but that's how you set it up. We bump the shoulder, we're ready to go to the next step. You need to have a trimming tool because eventually, like I said, brass is like water, it flows, it stretches. The more you work it, it's gonna elongate. And this is where your book's gonna come in handy. The book here, per Sammy Specs, the trim to length, which means what you wanna trim this to is 1.912. That's in the book. But if you look at Hornady's the, the, online, John just looked online, and it's 1.892, which there's, there's 20 thousandths worth of variance there. And we have this set up a little bit different. This is a drawed uh, powered case trimmer. It trims, it chamfers, and it deburrs all in one. For those of you guys that reload, you're gonna know the value of this. You're going to know uh, how much this actually increases your workflow. And it's, am I ever gonna make my money back on it? No, but I don't care. It's something that I wanted and it's something that gets us in and out, like I said earlier, done. So we'll fire this up. 
I'm going to show you guys what we've got for the trim length. These are these are once fired already, or more than once fired. These are multiple times fired. We just need to start trimming. We're at 1.9115. So it's it's really close to the Sammy trim two length. But like I said, we're going to trim this a little bit more so that it gives us a little bit more leeway, and we don't have to do this as often. You know, we'll be able to resize it a few different times, still measure it but be short enough it's not going to be crimping the case neck into into your bullet and I'll, I'll explain that real quick if you guys ever watch reloading videos one of the first reloading videos that I, I i remember watching these guys reloaded and they shot fired reloaded shot fired reloaded etc over and over and over and it, it stretched the case out and they never trimmed it and what happens is your case neck gets longer and longer and longer and it grows and you seat your bullet in and when you go to chamber your round that case neck literally pinches into your bullet and that causes unsafe pressure you know everything it's just it's not right so make sure you trim it and that's why we trim ours below sammy but a little bit above the lowest reading that hornady's online manual says so we'll turn this on this is a slick machine uh, real quick on this machine just so you guys uh, have a basic understanding the way that i did this is you can you, you measure this is basically a die and then there's a collet on the top that's adjustable and you measure it off the headspace of your rifle so once you have a, a once fired piece of brass you can make fine adjustments with this um, in increments to get your trim to length. It's a pretty simple, it may sound confusing, but it's not bad. It's a pretty simple, quick process. And I've got cutters for my 338 Norma, my 260, my 22 250, and 223. So we can just run through a mass of, of brass at once and be done with it. So we'll fire it up. This is what it looks like now. I could show you guys the measurements, but I'm telling you, you know, it, it is what it is. Done. There's one. We already did one before we started. Man, it's it's it sounds like it's grinding a lot off it. But this is the first time that I've I've trimmed these Lapua brass and it's probably been about four or five rounds. Four or five firings. And that's it. I mean, you're, you're done. That's it's such a slick machine. It's it's chamfered, deburred, and trimmed all in one. That's it's such a time-saving machine. It's it's freaking badass, is what it is. Okay, so what what I what I mentioned earlier was this was the the first time trimming these pieces of brass after about four firings, and what I said earlier, I don't want it to contradict what I said earlier by saying that uh, we try to make everything the same and brass does grow, but you want to always continue to measure your overall length. So you need to know so that you know if you need to trim it or not. And with these, like I said, I trim them a little bit shorter than what Sammy says in the book so that when so I don't have to do this every time I reload. That's why I do it. I, I trim these a little bit shorter so that every time we run the size or die through and I measure these, I'm still concentric or I'm still uniform, but I'm underneath the, the trim to case length that I, I don't have to worry about this step every single time. Just so you guys have an idea of where I'm going with that. That's recording. Okay, guys, just so you know, we have Tumblr media here. This is just a corn cob style media. And, uh, you know, it's, it's mildly abrasive enough to get this polished up nice and good like new. Uh, logistically speaking, this is probably not smart because I'm only doing five just for the purpose of this video, but I don't care. So we throw them in the tumbler. We put the top on. And then I seal it down and I'm going to run for a few hours. Just turn it on. Boom. Done. Tumble. A couple hours later, we took the brass out of the tumbler with all the media. We dumped it inside of our, our separator here. There's a, a pretty simple. Flop it around. Open it up. 
And what it does is it separates the media. Pretty simple deal. All the corn cob media is down at the bottom. And your brass. The whole five pieces that we did. We're gonna be kind of dirty, so we'll just polish them up a little bit with a, with a rag. And we'll go to the next step. I'll make note real quick before we get too far because there's gonna be some guys that are doing the actual tumbling process before I do it. And just a side note on that, a lot of guys may pick their brass up from the range. They might pick it up online. They might purchase it somewhere that they don't know where it came from. And I can completely understand tumbling brass just to maybe get any kind of inert material or objects out of it, freeing it up, keeping it clean. But personally, I do it after the annealing and resizing because I know where our brass is coming from. We pick it up almost every single piece that we shoot, we pick up. And before we do any of those processes, we tap it out, we make sure it's clean so that we don't have any issues when we run into that. After we tumble it though, after the resizing process and then, and then the tumbling process that follows, you do have to pay special attention to the primer pocket because the media that I use tends to get stuck in either the primer recess or sometimes even up into the flash hole. So you gotta pay, pay special attention to that. When I clean my primer pocket, you have a couple different options. This is a more aggressive cutter. This will go in and, and rip your, your primer pocket pretty hard. I don't really use that because I tend to keep them a little cleaner than normal. I'll just use these, which are a more rigid brush. They just rotate and you can put enough down pressure on to keep it clean. So take a look at the primer pocket before. Good. I'll boot it up. And it was a pretty easy process. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it's clean and it's good. That's all I do for cleaning my primer pocket. And then a, a side note here, these are flash hole deburr tools. This one's set up for the 260. This one is set up for this particular cartridge, the 22250. What that does is it uniforms the flash hole inside of your cartridge. And I do that one time, but I don't do it until I have the brass once fired. So you guys understand that it's a simple, it's a simple process. You turn it on, you put your case over it. You can feel it, give it a little tap and you can clean it out. And that uniforms your flash hole inside. You know, it, 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 it probably doesn't necessarily make a huge difference for what we do regarding precision, but it does uniform the flash hole and with uniformity goes back to what I said earlier. That's what we're after. The way that you can look at it now is all of our old brass that we did all of that prep work to is in line with what our new brass is. So from here on out, the steps are going to be the same for the new brass as opposed to the old brass. The only difference is the old brass has been fired more times and the new brass is just going to be fired. Next step is to prime, just feeling to make sure all these prim primers are seated uniform and they are because there's a stopping point on this press, on this primer tool, this coax primer tool from Forrester, which I highly recommend you guys get. Now, once all these are primed, I'll put them next side down. So they're ready to be charged. I've seen guys mention it quite a bit online and it's the truth. If you guys look here on the counter, there is a, a lot of guys say, don't put more than one kind of powder on the counter or on your reloading bench at once. So you don't have any mix ups or mess ups. And you guys can kind of see what we do. We take a dry erase marker and we mark down on the powder tubes on, on the hoppers, what powder it is. There you've got Retumbo, that's for the 6.5 PRC that we were reloading. 
We have H4350 right there. That's for the 260 that we were reloading. And then we have Varget here. It might be tough to see, but you can see it Varget written and then Varget here as well. And so we know what powder is in each one of our dispensers and we're not getting anything mixed up. So, uh, you know, pay attention to that. Just wanted to kind of give you guys an idea on how we do it. A lot of times we'll even just set powder a pound right on top so that for reference, guys know that's what it is. But usually I write it down with a, with a dry erase marker so that you can tell what the powder is, the powder type. All right, guys, so we've got the five pieces of brass that we've done everything meticulously to. Everything in theory should be exactly the same. The overall length, the neck tension, primer seating depth, the shoulder bump, everything the uniformity of the, the annealing. And now we're going on to the Matchmaster. Now these, these are pretty, pretty wicked machines. Uh, I just have mine in standard mode. There's a match mode that goes to two one hundredths of a grain, which right now, to tell you the truth, I'm not concerned about. There, that's not gonna be enough difference personally between a quarter inch group at 100 yards and a half inch group, I don't think, in my opinion. It's just as good or better than the charge masters. We'll put it that way. With the load that we're the, the the loads that we're charging here, that we're throwing here, it's going to be better than I can probably hold steady and shoot a group. It's gonna perform better than that. So what we're gonna do is I've already got my load data down. This is at your discretion. I'm not recommending you use this powder charge. It's right in the middle of the road regarding the, uh, um, the manual, read the manual, start low, work up. Don't do what we do and start high and work down. Just kidding. We don't do that. Uh, we start, I start low and kind of work my way up. If I shoot a group at a really low powder charge, I leave it. I don't care. I don't care how fast it's shooting. I don't care how slow it's shooting. I, I whatever, Whatever charge shoots the best group, that's what I'm after. So I already know what this particular rifle is. And at the end of this video, like I said, John shoots a group, I shoot a group. My particular charge for this 22 to 50 load is 35.0 grains of Varge, of Hodgkin Varget. So we're gonna throw it. We'll go 35. I'll speed this up. just because it takes forever. I'll cut away on it. It's going to go, it's gonna go. And these things are pretty cool because you can like Bluetooth them with your phone, which I don't ever do. It's whatever. See how, maybe, I, no, I'm on just on standard mode. I'm not on match. But it's, I, the, the cool thing about these, like the, the Charge Masters, I went in and I'm on Sniper's Hide, uh, one of the largest online shooting forums. I, they have guys that I have a list of parameters that you can go in and change so you can have it go like full bore speed up into five grains of your max charge and then it slows down. It'll speed up the process. I have, I have the parameters on all of these changed and I, I'm sure I, I know you can do it with this because look at this. It took that long to dump 35 grains. It's perfect. 35 grains. It takes a little bit, but that's right. We don't have nothing but time tonight. That charge is thrown, it'll re-zero, and it'll start going automatically. And we'll do all five of these. Usually for my workflow guys, what I'm doing, I've got like three of these bitches going at the same time, and I'm not stopping. One will beep, I'll dump it, I'll, I'll, throw, a, I'll throw a load, I'll throw a charge, I'll go over, seat a bullet, come back, another one will be ready, and just go back and forth, back and forth, and you'll never quit. You know, you're, you're, you're just, but for the purpose of this video, I'm just kind of showing you guys what things do, kind of slow things down so you guys get a basic understanding of it. There are some things that we're not talking about, but uh, we can break it down and go into more detail in other videos if you guys are interested. We'll do one more here and then we'll, we'll cut it. I'll just dump them. Now we're gonna go to seeding the bullets. The powder charge has been thrown on all of these. We're at perfectly measured 35 grains of Varget in each one of these cases. And the, the pill or the projectile of my choice for these, like I said, we're not, we're not sponsored by anybody. I just like to use a lot of times what's easiest. And 
you've heard me say it once, I'll say it again, the 22250 is inherently accurate. It's just a cartridge that you can, you can almost throw a powder charge, seat a bullet, and it's gonna shoot very well. It's very forgiving. And the bullet of our choice that we're using, I'm not putting a plug in for these guys, I just like it. It's a 50 grain Hornady VMAX. It's kind of tough to see, but at the base of that bullet is called a bolt tail. It's a recess. I don't use it because it's supposed to be ballistically inclined in any way, shape, or form. The reason that I use it is because it's easier to seat the bullet in the case neck. It just sits there. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a stupid reason, but these, these bullets shoot, man. They freaking, they shoot very well. They're an awesome little bullet. They're an awesome little pill, and that's why we use them. We've got a, a, a couple thousand of them, and they freaking are little hammers. What we're going to do is we're going to seat a bullet real quick. I've already got this set up. This, is, this cedar die is already set up for my particular rifle. And that is physically ready to go. That's what it looks like. That, that cartridge is ready to be fired and ready to hammer. Um, what I'm gonna kind of explain to you guys real quick is this is where you can start getting meticulous. Sure, you can get meticulous on the powder charge. Like, uh, um, you know, every grain or half a grain or a quarter of a grain of powder that you throw directly affects how your your bullet's going to fly, how it's going to perform downrange. Um, you know, there's a node. We could get into that if you guys listen to our podcast. There's a lot of guys that know a lot more shit than we do, but you can print it on paper. There, there's, there's data there. There's real-time field experience that you can see. You could have, for example, 35 grains of Varget in these loads and go shoot a five shot group and they may all be in a hole about that big. And then you go to 37 grains or even lower, say 33 grains, and that group may open up to three quarters of an inch. And what you're looking for is, what we're looking for is precision. So if, if, these, if these rounds shoot with this powder charge and whatever seating depth the book says, we'll leave it be. The easiest thing that I would tell you guys to do is open up your manual, go to your maximum cartridge overall length, measure from the tip of your bullet to your shell head, to your case head, and go with, the, and, and go with what the book says. That's gonna be your easiest route and your safest route. There's probably gonna be a significant amount of jump there from that bullet to the, from that ogive to the lands, but uh, you know you can mess with it from there on out. And what I'll, I'll kind of touch base on that real quick. So I've got a. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into detail and tell you guys how to do it. But I've got like a Sinclair. This is a seating depth gauge, and what it does is it gives you a series of measurements. You put a bullet. You literally take a bullet and put it up into the lands. You measure a point. You set a collar. You, you take a once fired piece of brass for that cartridge, for, sorry, for that chamber of fire form piece and you do the same thing and you set the, the collar and then you measure the distance and it gives you exact, the exact length. You, you, I, I would do that three to five times and then average the readings and that will give you a very approximate number to where this ogive where that bullet curvature begins touching touches your lands that's what that measurement will give you and what that is is just a reference point it's just a point where you can uh, uh, determine whether or not you want to go back further or not even determine to go back further but how far you want to go back further if you want to back it off three thousandths or two thousandths or one th each one rifle shoots different and what we try to do is is honestly have our gunsmith chamber all of our barrels that are the exact same barrels with the exact same reamer. And I know it's, you know, kind of rainbows and fairy tales, wishful thinking that each one of them is going to shoot the same. But a lot of times when you have a cartridge like the 250, you can get by with that. So what we're doing is we have, we have three rifles or six rifles, or actually in this case, nine rifles in each is a series of three 
the Mark Ones, the Mod Os, and then the Knight PRSs, they all are chambered consecutively with the same reamer, the same barrel by the same company, and we're using the same load data in each series of rifles, if you guys get what I'm saying, if you can understand that. But there's, there's the, the concept of seating depth, we could do a separate video on that, but really, I mean, that's the whole rundown of creating your own your own cartridge. It's, it's not hard to do. I know a lot of guys are really, um, the word is, you know, they, they might be intimidated by it. I know that I kind of was in the beginning, but man, it, you, you, I can tell you right now, the reason to get into reloading isn't necessarily to save yourself money because you're not especially the startup costs. I mean, you gotta buy the press, you gotta buy the dies, you've gotta buy all the components, all the tools. In this day and age right now, the way things are going, it's expensive. But personally, I'm willing to sacrifice more money for better performance. That's what this whole thing boils down to being able to, and there's a certain sense without running, without making this too, too long, too much of a run on, there's a certain sense of kind of gratification. It's pretty cool. It's fun to know that you make your own stuff in a way that you're custom tailoring a piece of equipment to another piece of equipment, or you're making a piece of equipment perform better than it would otherwise. And that's what our goal is here to break things down to make things perform on another level, like I said at the beginning, and that's what reloading does for us. Uh, like I said, I'd like to be able to maybe break this down and go into more detail, a finer detail on each specific process. Maybe we could do a video on just, you know, a specific powder charge, how we kind of uh, will chart that and maybe look for nodes, which a lot of guys say isn't, isn't even uh, a thing. If you chart it over and over and over, it's a gradual incline, there are no nodes. Um, we could do a, a review on the annealing, the amp machine, their drawed case trimmer, the powder dispensers, all that. So you guys be sure to leave comments. Let us know what you think. If uh, you want us to go into more detail, this is what we're all about. You know, there's so many things that we can talk about, so many different applications that we can inform you guys on based on kind of what we do and what we really enjoy doing. So we've got all these gassed up. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go shoot them. So I can show you guys the, the, not the development because these are already developed. The load development is already processed. It's already done. We've already figured that out with the rifle that I'm gonna be shooting. So I'm gonna shoot a quick three shot group with these at 110 yards at 100 meters. John's got his custom 250 that he's gonna shoot his group with. And we'll print them on paper real quick just to show you guys the, the desired groupings that we're after and then we'll be out. I think that's anything to complain about. It's a little off the left. But it's really close. Yep. I'm gonna go ahead. Which one are you gonna shoot at next? I can shoot at any of the black ones or anything. It doesn't matter okay. to me.
should probably go look at that. We should probably go look at that. Can we kill this? Yeah. I hope you guys found this video entertaining, but more importantly, I hope that you found it informational. Be sure to subscribe. We appreciate it, fellas. Uh, check out our Instagram pages, our uh, Facebook, as well as our podcast. We go into elaborate detail on a lot of the talking points on our podcast for those of you guys that have Anchor, iTunes, or Spotify. Just search James O'Neill or search Predator Hunter and you'll find it there. Once again, guys, this has been an O'Neill Ops reloading review from the loadout room with equipment that is designed for precision killing. We're out.